officially, although I don't really feel I've ever really left, but I realized like yesterday that coming back occasionally to preach a sermon means that you've got the uh, privilege of disappearing for a few weeks until you've forgotten everything that I said and then reappearing again when everything had calmed down. And I realize now that um, you're going to be here and see me every week, so I'm going to have to be a little bit more discerning what I say, aren't I? I was very tempted this morning to start my sermon by playing the music to Mission Impossible. The only reason I didn't is I don't really have the technology to work it out. And then to offer you the challenge, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fishes. I just think this story really lends itself to a Mission Impossible type program, doesn't it? And I I started getting a little bit carried away thinking about how you would uh, set about that sort of a program. But of course, it's such a well-known passage that we all know the answer, don't we? Because we've all heard the story before. And it isn't really Mission Impossible because 5,000 people were fed with seemingly five loaves and two fishes. But for those that were there and had no idea, there were very many different attitudes flying around that morning. None so than the disciples' attitude to the problem. And in the uh, reading that we've just heard of John's Gospel, it seems that poor Philip was the target. Although if you read the the same account in other versions, you will find that many of the disciples actually had the same problem and in fact in one of the versions it actually says that the disciples approached Jesus and said send these people home because we haven't got the resources to feed them but we'll stick with Philip at this point and we'll say that he was the one to which the attitude was very negative Jesus asked the question how are we going to feed 5,000 people Where are we going to buy the food? But Jesus already knew the answer. He was actually asking Philip this question because he wanted to know what the answer was going to be. And Philip said, well, Jesus, we're in the middle of the mountains here. There isn't a shop for miles, not even a Tesco Express. (laughs) And even if there was, we haven't got enough money to feed 5,000 people. Come on, Jesus, a touch of reality here might be good. Now, I feel a little bit sorry for Philip because I have to confess, I would very probably have the same attitude. I would say, oh, yeah, right, okay, good one, Jesus. 5,000 people? I don't think so. But, of course, Jesus wasn't expecting that answer. Well, maybe he was expecting it, but that's not the answer he needed. Philip was facing this problem in a very human way because he was a human being. And if you put it in very human terms, it was mission impossible. And maybe it was a very good idea if, as the other disciples had suggested, they all went home and looked after them. But Jesus was looking for something else. And he found that something else with the next person, that little boy. And his attitude was very different. Now, I love this little boy. I wish I knew who he was. I wish I knew why he was there. Was he a shepherd boy who decided to go down and see what all the commotion was about and just happened to have his packed lunch that his mum had given him that morning? Or was he one of Jesus' followers who knew exactly what Jesus was about. And he had the faith to believe that miracles happened. Because you see, one of the problems that Philip had was that Philip might have been a very human person, but Philip had actually already witnessed a few weeks previous Jesus turning water into wine. He'd already seen Jesus walk on the water. So he knew that no matter how human this problem was, how insignificant this problem was. He was not serving an insignificant human master. But this little boy understood. 
And he came to Jesus with his little pack lunch, his five barley loaves and his two fishes. And he said, Jesus, is this any good to you? Because I know you can do something with it. Now, it might have been childish naivety at this point, thinking, well, I've got five loaves and two fishes. That'll solve the problem. But whether it was naive or whether it was great faith, he gave away his pat lunch. He had a generous heart. He didn't say, but this is my packed lunch. It's mine. You're not having it, like a lot of children would have said, and a lot of adults would have said too. He said, well, I'll give it to you. If it's going to be any use to you. And I think that at that point probably put the disciples a little bit to shame. Although I suspect that some of them are going, <laughs> five loaves, two fishes, how far is that going to get? But Jesus didn't say that. Jesus gratefully accepted it. And then he held it up and he said to God, thank you. He didn't say, God, we've got five loaves, two fishes, 5,000 people. Boy, we need a big miracle here. He said, thank you, God. This is yours. Do with it what you want to do. Because the attitude that Jesus had was with God, all things are possible. God is already committed to these people. And God would solve the problem through Jesus' faith or through the faith of the little boy. Jesus already knew what was going to happen. But after he'd given thanks to God, 5,000 people were fed. Now, I'd love to know what actually happened. I'd love to know if it didn't rain fishes and bread loaves at that point, or whether baskets of food miraculously appeared, or whether no one ever saw any food at all except five loaves and two fishes. But somehow everyone was fed. And everyone was satisfied with what they had. But there's one attitude that we've left out this morning. And that's God's attitude. And that is displayed in 12 baskets of food that was left over. Because God isn't a God that just deals in emergency rations. God didn't do a quick calculation in his head and think to himself, 5,000 people? That means we need 10,000 fish and probably 40,000 bread loaves. Okay, there you go. God poured out in abundance. More than what they needed. Because God is a God of generosity. He is an abundant God. And he always promises to give far more than ever we ask. So long as we ask. So there were 12 basket lo- basketfuls of food left over that morning, which I'm sure was distributed amongst even more people. With God, everything is possible. He takes what little we have and he multiplies it for the good of others. But the key to all this is thanksgiving. The key to all this was when Jesus held up that meager ration of food to God and he said, thank you, God. That's when the spiritual bit started happening because God received it and received the grateful heart of that little boy and the great faith of Jesus at that moment. And he did something incredible with it. And that's the true meaning of harvest. It's fantastic that we've managed to achieve this. It's amazing. But actually, it isn't, shouldn't, or shouldn't be a one-off. It, we shouldn't have to wait till next harvest to send out more boxes to Romania. Or food that we've given for, um, for the poor in Bradford. Because that will run out, and more needs to be given. And we shouldn't have done it because, oh, well, it's harvest. I suppose we'd better do something, attitude. We should have that attitude of thankfulness and say thank you 
because that's what true harvest is all about, saying thank you for all that we have. Now, when I first went out to India, to the third world, and experienced third world poverty for myself, I struggled coming back to England. I really struggled to see this society. And I really struggled when I came to Harvest Festival. I found it difficult to say thank you because I felt as if I was rubbing it in to those that had nothing. I found it difficult to say thank you for a successful harvest, for the fact that we'd had enough rain, just enough rain, amazingly enough, in this country, to have a successful harvest, when I knew that harvests had failed in other countries. But I've grown over the years to realise that what I've got, I can give away. I might think that I have very little in comparison to some people, but in comparison to the third world, I'm very, very wealthy. And so is everyone else in this country. And so is everyone else in the West. And I know that we give. And I know that we keep on giving. But do we actually say thank you for what God has given us? Do we actually say thank you that I'm in a position to give? And do we give like that little boy and give everything that we have over to God? Because when we adopt that attitude, then we've got the true meaning of harvest. When we adopt that attitude, we can achieve, with the help of God, amazing things. We know, and it's been highlighted a lot this year with the IF campaign, we do have enough food in this country to feed the whole of the world. It's only that we don't distribute it properly. It's only that some take more than they should. We can be part of the answer. But more times than not, we're part of the problem. Because we look at ourselves and we think, well, there's very little I can do to help. My five loaves and two fishes are not going to go very far, therefore I'm going to keep them. No, that's not what God's about. God's in about multiplication business, and that's what he'll always do. What God is looking for is a thankful heart. It doesn't matter if we think we have absolutely nothing to offer God. We offer ourselves and everything that God gives us with a thankful heart. We learn to say thank you. It's a word we don't use very much these days. And I have to confess, I'm as bad as everybody else. But it's lovely, isn't it, to see children saying thank you for their meals. It's lovely when people come and say thank you for that act of kindness. A few weeks ago, I was staying um, in Devon. I was visiting a friend who I hadn't seen for three years because she now lives in Australia. And I was staying with this lovely woman called Audrey. And she had every reason to be a little bit crotchety because two years previous, she'd lost her husband. She was widowed, she was struggling. Her husband had Alzheimer's and she'd spent five or six years very distressed nursing him and seeing his personality change. And she'd struggled since then. I knew she was struggling. But I have never met such a godly woman in my life. And it taught me so much. She'd get up about five o'clock every morning. She'd try and be really quiet so she didn't wake me up. And she'd start praying. And I could hear her. And I wasn't listening to her prayers. But all I could hear was thank you. I knew she had a list of things that she was saying thank you to God for. And she had me pray with her every night before she went to bed. And her prayer was, thank you for today. And every morning she'd wake up and say, thank you for the opportunity. And she's now spending her life, instead of feeling sorry for herself, instead of struggling as a widow, she's going out and she's helping carers who are looking after their partners going out and being a blessing to them and if she's not doing that she's raising money for uh, she was raising money for a Christmas meal for them when I was there she didn't have very much but what she had she was truly grateful for and she said thank you and she used her gifts and abilities to say thank you there's enough of us here this morning to make a huge difference to the world's problems but we just need to recognize it and we need to say thank you for everything God has done and to say, I give 
all that I have to you, Lord, and let the Lord do the rest. Let's not be part of the problem by having a negative attitude. Let's be one of the, part of the answer to the problem. And let St. Peter's and you as individuals really make a difference this year and in the years to come. Because God has got a son, we say thank you. We have a generous heart. And a generous heart plus God equals a miracle. Is this mission impossible? Far from it. Amen. Thank you very much indeed, Moina. In response to what we've heard, let's stand and sing in praise to God, the hymn, Praise, O oh Praise, Our God and King. The words are on the screen. Can we stand, please, as we sing together?
I'd like to ask Ron if you'd come and lead us in our prayers, please. If you'd like to sit or kneel as we pray. Let us all pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same by your mighty power. And grant that this day we fall into no sin, nor run into any kind of wickedness. But that all our doings may be ordered by your governance to do always that which is right in your sight. Amen. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, here in this church, and we look around to our familiar scenes, familiar faces, and yet we've come in from the outside, the outside where the world is in great trouble. We look at the people dying in the Mediterranean as they try to find peace and plenty. We think of the thousands of people from Syria that are in camps with nothing. We look abroad to the Far East. We look everywhere, Lord, and there's trouble and strife. And we are here in our little church almost immune from it all. Oh Lord, when we think of the story for today, with 5,000 men and probably in addition women and children as well, seated on the grass and on the hillside, and a boy comes forward. Lord, we feel like the little boy. We don't have much. And we look out at the thousands and thousands and thousands of people all over the world with so much trouble and strife and hunger and pain. And all we have is five loaves and two fish. Lord, sometimes we pray to you about all these problems and yet quite often in the back of our minds we say, what is this among so many? Lord, we prayed for years for Northern Ireland and it got more and more violent. Lord, we want to come to you today and present what we have, the things that we possess, the gifts that we have. Lord, help us not to say so much what is that among so many, but help us to give back to you what you've given us. And pray that you will lift it to the heavens and bless it and use it. And use our prayers and our concern and our love to help all those around us. We think of the message that there are more food banks in Yorkshire than anywhere else in this country. Lord, we can be cynical and say, well, it's their own fault. Or we can be like the little boy and say, take what I have and bless it and use it. Dear Lord, change our hearts. Help us not to despair when we see the problems, but to give thanks and offer what we have. Lord, we think of those people in their homes today who are ill and sick and frightened. 
Lord, it's a terrible thing to be frightened and to be alone and to not know what's happening to you. And we pray that somehow you will comfort those in great need and help us, Lord, where we can to take your love to them in their loneliness and in their pain. Perhaps just to hold a hand. Perhaps just to offer a prayer. Perhaps just to love. Lord, we pray for the men and women in our country and all over the world who have the power to do great things. May they be guided not so much by selfishness, but what can we do to help others? Lord, many of us don't know what it is to have such great powers, and so we commend to you these men and women who can in their own way change the world, and we pray that you will guide them by your spirit and not by any other thing. And finally, Lord, we pray for those who are coming to the end of their days, for those who are lonely and dying, for those who are terrified of what whole is held for them. We pray, Lord, that they may be able to reach out to you and find your hand so that you may carry them through the threshold into that land of peace with you. So, Lord, we commit ourselves into your hands. We pray that you will guide us to take what we have like the little boy and offer it to you and ask you to use it. We ask this in Christ's name. Can we say the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you very much, Ron. Just a minute. <laughs> As we uh, come towards the end of our service, I'd like to just show you a short film, a new film made by Tear Fund, which was made in Cambodia. Um, at the beginning, if you can't hear, it's, there are subtitles on because uh, the people concerned don't speak English. But we thought today about what our response should be in the face of the fact that we have so much compared to many others around the world. We've heard, too, that our giving happens in lots of different ways, including through the prayers that we offer. And I hope that what you see here will actually just stimulate a few thoughts for you and will help you to think about how you pray for others, both now and in the future. Thank you. ຖ້າຊີວິດປຽບໂດຍຊີລົມນາດາລະຮູດດາສອບថ្ងៃນີ້ໃນ <coughs> ຈົ່ງການອອດແລ່ນັ້ນບ່ອງອອດຄ້າຍສົກຈັດອອດຖູກກະຊວນ
Hoffnung kann bessern machen. เพิ่นได้ខ្ញុំទៅធ្វើការចឹងមកទឹកនោះសម្រាប់បានគុញនៅគាត់ <cười> Mắt mua cái bay sắp tay ngay chị cruy yum nuôi. Lê kung krom yu nung, kle bát ti, tay kam chị. Do chị cruy sáng chị nha chị kwa chuk kalong bát chị 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 ពុទ្ធិហោដូចជាការយកចំមួនប្រសិនបើពួកគេអត់ Lần này, tôi đã được lắp đặt ở nơi chung với bếp hiện đại bàn tù phát về yard. Bọn tay yung chong bụi tay 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 Bất bình miên chẳng bên nhưng bài chất lên và bài chất mong mong Ở thầm miên tia, miên đây là xóm rung nâu khuôn ai Chẳng tớ nhóm khuôn xa nhóm có cảm thu chẳng muốn Về lực nhóm đa màu Áo chuộc lâu bì, lâu mùi lỏ, lâu mùa cỏ Chẳng nhóm mình ai miên nằm nách Xem rạp chơi rơi rơi dục lâu lỏn bàn tì So I simply ask you to think about what you've seen and heard this morning and to use that to inform your prayers and perhaps to pray in a different way for some of those issues. Because as we saw at the beginning, there are things to do with business and with governments that need to change. But the church is not as powerless in that process as we, as we often think. And if we can just with the small contributions that we've been thinking about this morning, if we're prepared to do those things, we can, do, we can help with the empowerment of families like the one you've seen there. And we're trying to do that within this church by supporting certain projects like that, which our mission partners are very heavily involved in, which is why I encourage those of you who don't know much about our mission partners yet to get to know about them through the Mission Matters Bulletin that gets issued from time to time and which there are copies of around today. So thank you very much and I hope that's been a helpful and informative uh, exercise to do with you this morning so that the lessons of, of harvest actually go with us uh, into the future. So can we all stand please?
As we draw our service to a close, we sing together. We plow the fields and scatter the good seed on the land. The words are on the screen. Thank you.